<laughs> Great. Okay. Well, let's let's get started. If everyone can please uh, mute themselves um, for the presentation, so then we don't have any um, unnecessary background noise, um, and uh, we'll we'll get started. So I'd just like to welcome you uh, tonight or this afternoon for those of you in in the U.S. or Canada. Um, to this first Zoom meeting of the year. So last year we had a, several of these, uh, but this is the first one we've had in 2024. So it's it's great to to have you all here. Um, we're um, going to go through uh, a bit of an agenda. Um, uh, we first of all would like to welcome uh, welcome you to the Zoom. So I'm Colin Geddes, the co-founder and co-race director of the event. And my wife, partner, is Tess Geddes, who's also on the call. And she's our co-founder and co-race director as well. So um, she'll be involved in this this evening's presentation. Just Hello, me... everyone. Um, so the present so tonight, we're, it's going to be a relatively short presentation. I've got a few slides put together which is going to talk about the event, what makes it different from other types of events like this. It'll uh, talk about the challenges um, of the event itself, um, talk a bit about uh, you know, logistics around the course and the camps and the checkpoints, and we'll touch on things like gear, gear acquisition, uh, and, and talking about testimonials as well. So what I'd rather do is actually have more of the time spent on the Q&A at the end um, so that we can have give people an opportunity to ask questions rather than having being too top heavy with the presentation. Um, if you could just mute, please, That's anyone. Who... Uh, if somebody could just mute, please. Um, um, so the, if I just go back there, um, the, during the Q and A sessions, you can use the, the zoom chat messages to put your hand up or just physically put your hand up and Tess will look out for them or you, or you can send a message to Tess throughout the, the presentation as well, if you want to get it recorded. So. The Grand to Grand Ultra is America's original self-supported foot race. So it's six stages over seven days and covers 275 kilometers or 171 miles. So there's one of our starts um, over the last uh, 10 years. You'll see it starts at the edge of the, the Grand Canyon. So where is it? So it takes place in both Arizona and Utah. It crosses the state line between Arizona and Utah. And it starts at the north rim of the Grand Canyon, which so it's a very remote location that we got permission to, to um, start it from. And it finishes at something called the Pink Cliffs on the Grand Staircase. So the star Grand Staircase is this geologic formation that has different colored um, steps going up. So when you say steps, these are huge areas of geology, which all have different colors. So there's the Grand Canyon. That's a photograph from the start. And at the very end, you get views of Bryce, which has, for so, those of you who have been to Bryce National Park, have got these very famous hoodoos of Red Rock. It's the first race of its kind ever in North America. So the 11th edition is happening this year, for those of you lucky to come for the first time. We were interrupted by the pandemic for two years, so this should have been our 13th edition, but we were unable to hold it in uh 2020 and 2021 because people were not allowed to get into uh, north america travel into north america so what are some of the key features of g2g well it's as i mentioned six stages over seven days with one overnight stage which is the third day we have cutoff times which apply for every checkpoint and every stage and you camp overnight so we create six different remote de remote desert camps and our camp crew busily you know erected every day we actually have now and we'll talk about this a little later a self-supported 
uh, category. So self-supported competitors must carry all their own food, gear, and clothing. Sorry, self-supported competitors must carry all their own food, gear, and clothing, and we will provide a ration of water and a place to sleep. So the same rules apply to the new supported category, except those competitors will have most of their gear carried for them between camps. Challenges include altitude. We'll talk about that in a little bit. The average altitude is about 2,000 meters. Desert terrain. We've got a lot of sand that you have to cover. Uh, heat. And here uh, we talk about temperature difference because it's a high desert. Um, it's hot during the day and cold at night. And distance. Total ascent is 5,207 meters, and the highest altitude is 2,194 meters. So it's not the highest in terms of climbing. You know, there are many more uh, challenge challenges of races in the Alps, for example, which have got more ascent. But this has got a greater variety of challenges in things like the desert terrain. And entrants can compete either individually or in teams of two or three. And the number of entries are limited by country quotas. So please enter ASAP. We, we do that because we like to have uh, a range of countries in each edition. Typically, we have anywhere from 15 to 25, depending on the number of entrants, uh, uh, different countries in, in uh, every edition. So it's a very uh, international type of event. So our race is hard. But that's not been the objective of how we created the race. It's actually to have the best managed races where the competitors optimize their experience. That's what we're really trying to, to do here. So what is a self-supported race? Well, as I mentioned, all the competitors must carry their food, gear, and clothing. And we will only provide a ration of water and a place to sleep for the week. So think of this as not just simply an ultra race of 100 miles uh, where you've got huge amounts of support around you and you're not carrying anything. But think of it as an adventure. It's really like a, a survival in the desert for a week. So we're giving you the minimum of support that you need to get through the week. But you're basically carrying everything you need for the week, including all your food to survive. So therefore, preparation is really key to making a success of this. And, you know, for a lot of people, you can just turn up to a marathon, you can get it done without having to think about nutrition or what you're wearing or anything. But with our race, it's much more than that. It's all much, much more about preparation <laughs> and figuring out how you can get through the week in minimizing the weight you have to carry. So that uh, just going back to that picture there, that's uh, Garth, our race commissioner, checking in one of our competitors, going through all of their equipment for the week. So we've we'll touch on the mandatory equipment that they've got to prove that they have. Plus, we'll give some last minute advice as to whether people's packs are too heavy or not. And the picture on the right is one of our a typical uh, campsite that we'll build in the desert. So these are big, you know, uh, enclosed canvas 10-man tents where we put a maximum of eight people in each tent so they're relatively roomy and you know you're protected from the elements so if there's any wind for example you know they're they're very sturdy tents and you're protected so we've now got a supported category so we were starting to get a lot of interest from people who said you know we'd really love to do the race but we're just not sure about our ability to carry you know, a heavy pack on our backs for the week. So as a result of that, last year we piloted the start of a supported category and feedback we got was, is actually a great idea because it's a great way to uh, introduce people to uh, self-supported stage racing, but they've lacked the experience. You know, a lot of people really want to do it and they're, but they're a little bit nervous about jumping in in that first one. So this way, we allow people to, you know, jump in, do it, but we'll carry most of their 12 kilo bag between camps. They'll still need to carry most of their mandatory equipment on the course each day, but uh, the bulk of that uh, 12 kilos will be carried for them between the camps. Entrants will run exactly the same course 
uh, as a self-supported category, stay at the same camp, the, the checkoff time, the, the, the cutoff times every checkpoint and every camp will be the same and every rule will apply identically. The only difference is uh, your camp crew will carry most of their pack for them that they don't need on the course during the week between camps. So as I said, their runners will only carry what they need for the on the course each day for the support category. So here's some GGG facts. Um, right from the beginning, we've always wanted to be an environmentally friendly race. So we've never used plastic bottles. That was always a, one of our aims. We we were, you know, disappointed to, at least to see races around the world where whether it was marathons or ultra marathons, um, handing out thousands of plastic bottles which were discarded so um we've you know got us a way to supply fresh water to each of the checkpoints and the campsites so to date we've had over a thousand starters and 840 finishers so our overall dnf rate of, is 22 percent typically in an average year over the last uh 10 editions it's typically worked out between 20 and 23 percent having said that the last two years which were we think was related to the pandemic the the actual dnf rate was much higher so we had smaller numbers but it was a higher rate um we've got very close relationships with the local community they were instrumental in helping us get the race off the ground because it's a very remote part of america so we needed the locals to to chip in and give us advice and help us out We've had 57 countries take part so far, and I believe this year we've got another two or three new countries, so we'll be up to 60 by the end of this year. We have a great GTG community uh, around the world, and one of the things you'll notice, if, if you've done a stage race before or if you haven't done one, then you will actually make great friends by the end of the week. You'll make friends with your fellow competitors as well as um you know the volunteers and the staff at the event itself so you're really going through you know a lot of highs and lows with people intensely over that week so you will you know join that community and get a lot of advice from them we think that we're the best managed self-supported foot race in the world and that's something we strive for from year to year so we're continually making improvements every year we we put a list of improvements we want to make uh, and we execute those for the following year. So that's important to us. And, you know, it's it's really important from a risk mitigation point of view as well. So we we like the the fact that we're what we call a digital detox race. So we, we try and avoid bringing new technology uh, into the race. We want to give people um, a break from using their phones, their computers, and any other form of digital communication. So for a week... They're really connecting with nature and conversing with their fellow competitors. Um, and so therefore we have to take care of them. And we, we're we always looking for, for ways to mitigate risk and make sure you know we never lose people in the desert. So um, we'll talk about various ways that we do that. But basically in all the uh, 10 years that we've held the race, we've never lost anyone. And uh, you know we, we're, we, we're due in such a way that uh, we make sure people are well looked after. So a lot of people have done the Marathon de Sable and, and some people ask, well, what's the difference between the two? Well, the, the our race is considerably diff more, more difficult. I know the MDS calls itself the toughest foot race in the world, but ours is definitely harder. I mean, there are other races out there that are harder, but ours is a direct comparison because it's such a similar format. So first of all, we're 30 kilometers longer. Our long stage is on day three. So by that stage, your pack is still heavier because you won't have eaten through all of your food yet. We've got uh, more soft sand in our terrain. And I would say we've got more varied terrain, which is technical. We're at a higher elevation. So while the Marathon de Sable is largely at sea level, ours is at an elevation of around 2,000 meters. Um, we've got a larger temperature variation. So typically during the day, because it's at the end of September, our 
daytime temperatures are usually around 25 to low 30s centigrade, so maybe around 80 Fahrenheit. Um, and you know, we have had one or two years where it gets down to zero at night, but that's quite unusual. It normally gets down to single digit centigrade, so somewhere around five to 10 degrees centigrade, so maybe around 40 Fahrenheit in the evenings. Therefore, our mandatory gear is different. So that's why you'll see from our rules that we require a warmer sleeping bag. We require a light down jacket and uh, more food. However, we do mitigate that by providing better tents, which are you know full with walls all the way around, thick canvas, and we provide hot water um, at each of the campsites in the morning and in the evening. So you, you're ready, you don't have to carry a stove, you're ready prepared with lo lots of hot water to rehydrate me your meals. Our toilets are more civilized. So mm -hmm. from day one, we've always had really nice hy hygienic toilets at each of the campsites. Water is restricted. We do ration it. You'll see that in the rules. Um, but we're more generous uh, in terms of supply of water uh, than Marathon de Sable. Uh, and you know, we always make sure we have more than enough supply at the camps and each of the checkpoints. So if you did have an exceptionally hot day, um, you know, we'll never run out of water. And importantly, it doesn't come in plastic bottles. So here's our mandatory equipment list. Um, got to have a backpack, we recommend 20 to 25 liters. Sleeping bag rated at zero Celsius, 32 Fahrenheit or warmer or lower, whatever way you look at it. Sleeping pad, light down jacket, poncho, compass, small knife, signal mirror, whistle. Two headlamps with spare batteries. Red flashing light. You must bring your own containers to so two 750 milliliter uh, plastic bottles to take to carry with you. A minimum of 2,000 calories per day for each of the days. So you start off the week with a minimum of 14,000. Your country flag patch for your left shirt. Uh, and you'll be given a race patch on for your right sleeve. And a blister kit, which we will provide courtesy of trail toes. So you should be familiar with that, but you will be provided with that when you get to Canab. So let's talk about gear. Here's an example, here's a sprinkling of the type of gear um, that you'll be bringing. So for those of you who've done a stage race before, you'll be familiar with this. But for those who are not, this is the type of gear that you'll have to bring with you. So we've given examples there. There's, there's, we're, we don't uh, necessarily advocate any particular brand. There is lots of good brands for each of these products. And it's very much up to uh, you know, an individual uh, taste as to what they prefer. Uh, the backpack is a good place to start because um, once you've made friends with your backpack, they'll, you'll then figure out how much it can fit in, in terms of all of your other stuff. Um, this year, we've actually um, added a new rule to help people, which is that we will require everyone to have a pack that weighs no more than 12 kilos, excluding their water on day one. So we found in the past, a lot of people who who actually DNF, and they usually DNF early in the race, is they carry way too much stuff. So they'll, instead of having, you know, maybe two pairs of socks, they're bringing half a dozen pairs of socks or they're, you know, they're just bringing too much stuff with them that they can't use. They're, bring, they're carrying food that's not been dehydrated or it might be gels, which is carrying a lot of water. Um, so one way to make sure that forces them down in terms of the weight, that's why we're saying it can't be more than 12 kilos. And in fact, you'll find that people who are more experienced will, will actually reduce their weight to significantly under 12 kilos.
So at the checkpoints and camps, you know, we've got really great experienced staff and volunteers to help the competitors. Um, it's a great atmosphere. Our volunteer, we have a lot of volunteers. I would say typically in any one year, at least half our volunteers are repeat volunteers. These are people that come year after year because they love the experience. They love the, the camaraderie, meeting new friends. Um, and it's like a great big get together party for everyone. So um, we never have a problem filling our um, quota of volunteers each year. Um, we get some great, we give, we actually give um, priority in terms of volunteers to those who've had previous experience, either at our race or other races. Um, but uh, it's really important to us that when people arrive at checkpoints or at camp, they have very knowledgeable volunteers and people to help them. You know, there's an example of a, a board at one of our checkpoints saying how far you've come, how far it is to the next water drop or to the next checkpoint, how far to the camp, etc. So our our volunteers go through a whole day of training in Kanab, uh, two days before the race starts, where we bring them up to speed for that year. Um, and that's really important to us that we don't we don't just stick people on checkpoints that know what they're they don't know what they're talking about. They're actually there because they're actually trained. <clears throat> So here's our stage lens. You'll see that every day, except the final day, is uh, pretty much an ultra marathon. So everyone's about a marathon in length or a little bit longer, apart from stage three, which is a double marathon. That's the night stage, and that one has a that one has a cutoff total time of thirty four hours. So um, that one has a staggered start of either eight in the morning for most people or 10 a.m. for the elite runners. But that's basically how it breaks down over the whole week. You'll see that we have four checkpoints per day. So typically, um, you know, it's anywhere from 10 to 12 kilometers uh, between checkpoints. So I mentioned earlier about our elevation profile. So the, the course starts at a pretty high elevation of 1,600 meters and finishes at 2,100 meters. So it's fairly undulating. Um, so you're not just going up and up. It's actually, you know, there's a lot of up and down in the course. Um, so the total ascent is 5,207 meters, total descent 4,724. So that's a profile. It looks very extreme because of the, the scale, um, but it's it's if you spread, you can imagine if you spread the horizontal axis, uh, it's not you know it wouldn't be as extreme as that. But that gives you an idea of how it's spread out over over the um, the course of the week. So why do people want to do the the Grand to Grand Ultra? Well, it's the only stage race to start. Uh, from the rim of the Grand Canyon, one of the seven natural wonders of the world. And you know, Tess and I have been to the Grand Canyon many, many, many times, mainly to do with when we were designing the course and also during the race. Um, but you know, we find it amazing to see every time. And it's it's one of the great thrills we have when we uh let people, we bring people out to this remote location for them to to see it for the first time. For those, even those who have seen the Grand Canyon. Uh, before they get a real thrill of seeing it from this particular location. It's got the most varied terrain. So we take people through sand dunes. We take them through amazing desert terrain where you've got landscapes like there, you've got Zion in the background. And we take them through slot canyons as well. So it's, it's amazing terrain for them to experience during the week. And it's something different every day. So we always think that solitude and connecting with nature is really important. So for a lot of, unless you're doing it in a, in a, a team, a lot of the time you might find yourself out on your own there, which is actually a, a great thrill to be out there on your own and see these huge landscapes where you might not see anyone else around you. And the fact that we don't allow mobile phones is a fantastic feature because you're out there in a, with a lot of peace a lot of the time where you can really just absorb the experience. So we've got great landscapes. Here's one of our 
um, camps. This is camp two um, with the Vermilion Cliffs in the background. And we have, this is one of the darkest spots on the planet because it's very remote. We don't have any light pollution. And so every night you'll see billions of stars up there. That's the Milky Way. So for most people coming from cities around the world, they don't see the, the stars at night. So it's a great way for them to enjoy seven nights camping out under the stars and really, um, and, and really experiencing that. So what sort of people do stage race ultramarathons? Well, we find they're from all over the world, as I said earlier. Our youngest so far is 21 years old. Our oldest has been 75, and that 75-year-old finished the race. They're typically people who like to enjoy an active lifestyle and nature. Um, they want to overcome an amazing challenge with other people who like to do the same thing. They're very motivated. We have about two-thirds male one third female that's been pretty uh, stable throughout the whole 10 years some people like to do multiple ultras each year and really challenge themselves and these are people who typically travel around the world in search of adventure and uh, meeting new friends and being able to tell people what they've done which is you know for most people to say they you know, traveled 171 miles across the high <coughs> desert of the U.S. is not easy to contemplate. So it's a very small, you're one of a very small number of people who've done that. Here's some of our anecdotes from people. I won't uh, read them out, but I'll just let you read them yourself there. But this is, these are just a sprinkling. We've got many more on our website. This is very, very typical of the types of feedback we get. And for Tess and I, it's um, you know one of the one of the great rewards is when people come up and and say thank you to us at the end when they cross that finish line. That's we know we've done our job right, and they've had a an experience they'll never forget. So here's some success tips. So we'd recommend that you check out our website and our blog feature called Checkpoint, which has got lots of great articles in it. Get to the start line injury free, so don't overdo your training. Get in the right frame of mind. It's an adventure, so it's probably more of an adventure than it is a race. So for most people who aren't aiming to be podium, you'll enjoy that adventure. Adequate training means time on your feet. So not so much about getting the speed in, but more about getting out there and getting distance in your feet um, for the months leading up to it. As I mentioned earlier, keep your pack as light as possible. We won't allow you on the course if it's 12, if it's more than 12 kilos, but we'd encourage you to get under that. Nutrition, again, don't bring too much food. So typically half of your pack will be your food. If it's more than half of your pack weight, then you've got way too much food. And we will be doing a series of Zoom calls later. One of the things we'll be talking about will be nutrition. Um, make sure you test your nutrition a long time in advance. So we find that one of the main reasons for people to DNF is that they bring the wrong food um, or they've brought food that might work, but they haven't tested it in advance. And so they haven't been able to digest it under duress. So make sure you practice with your food, try different types of food, and test it well in advance. Recovery is key because you're doing this distance every day for a week. So therefore, when you do get into camp, you try and avoid the temptation to be walking around and chatting as much as possible. Try and get your feet up, um, elevate them, and maximize your sleep. Because it's all about, at the end of the day, it's all about staying warm in camp and recovering so you're fresh for the next morning. Anticipating hot spots and making sure you you look after your feet before they become blisters is a key success factor. And well, remarkably, 
uh, this is a simple one, but don't pack essential items in your check-in luggage on the aircraft. Uh, we've had people do that in the past and the luggage didn't arrive. And so they're having to scurry around a day before the race, trying to put together gear in order to, to stay in the race. So please just take everything on board with you that you need for the race and anything that goes in the check-in luggage is something is things that you don't need for the race itself. And lastly, hydrate well. So just remember you are in a high desert, so it's quite dry and uh, you know, you've got elevation and, and heat to contend with. And finally, your reward is the buckle. Um, and here's one of our um, competitors. He's actually from Germany, Germany, Kirsten from uh, Germany, who thoroughly enjoyed his finish. So next steps are sign up online as soon as possible if you haven't done it. Join our GG community on Facebook. So we are on Facebook and Instagram and Strava, it's YouTube, but um, the GG group on Facebook um, will give you access to everyone. We've got about two and a half thousand people on it. Many of these people are alumni. They've done the race and they'd be happy to answer any questions you've got. Also, it's got a great search function. So whether you search the Grand to Grand page on Instagram, on, on uh, Facebook or in the GTG group, um, you'll be able to, you know, look for questions, uh, look for answers on questions that you you want to know uh, the answers to. Think about engaging a trainer with specific ultra stage race experience. Um, we've just added a, uh, a couple of trainers to our website. So Elizabeth Barnes, who I think Elizabeth's on the call tonight. We're very pleased that she's joined us as a, a, in our training corner. She's a, a twice Marathon de Sable champion, and she's actually the second fastest female ever to have completed the Grand to Grand Ultra. So she's an impressive athlete who also professionally trains people to finish races like the Grand to Grand Ultra. Uh, Trevor Daverport from the US, who finished the race last year, He's also uh, a professional trainer and he's joined our training corner too. So we definitely commend those uh, trainers to you. And, you know, it's something that we, a very good use of your time and money to actually employ a trainer um, if this is your first uh, self-supported stage race. Check out the rules. Our rules are very comprehensive in our website, gtgultra.com. And commence training preparation and gear acquisition. So you're, if you do employ a trainer, they'll be able to give you a lot of guidance on your schedule. Um, but, you know, it's all about time over the next six months to get in shape um, and preparing yourself in terms of, as I mentioned, practicing with nutrition, putting your gear together in terms of what works and what doesn't work for you. Uh, as I mentioned, the great advice and tips from the group in Facebook, book your flights. Typically, the earlier you book them, the the less expensive they are. You know, you get some amazing deals uh, from Europe nonstop, from European capitals to Las Vegas, whether it's London or Paris or Frankfurt. Uh, there are many great um, uh, airline choices to, to fly into Las Vegas. Uh, from there, it's about a four-hour bus journey to get up to Canab, which is Race HQ. Check your visa needs. So it's very easy. The ESTA for people from uh, Europe and the UK. So it's very simple to get into the US. Um, now we're going to do a Q&A session. So uh, I've seen that under chat, there's been a lot of questions. So I don't know if Tess would like to read some of these out or um, if, if there's any you, anyone's got any questions on the presentation now or anything else you'd like us to try and answer for you, then please raise your your Zoom hand and we'll uh, we'll actually then ask you to unmute and, and ask your question. Tess, can I hand it over to you? Have you got do you want to read out um, some of your questions? Actually, no, there's there's no um, questions so far. Just people <clears throat> people saying hi. Um, but so far, okay, here we go. Here we go. First question. Um, 
are we able to ship our gear ahead of time as opposed to flying it? Hmm. We've, we've never really had um, anybody do this before. Um, you could you could probably send it to the hotel that you're going to be staying at. So our official hotel is the Parry Lodge. Um, and um, when you arrive in Kanab, so you have to be in Kanab at the latest on Thursday evening, and your um, entry fee will only include your stay for the Friday. So you will need to be somewhere in Kanab anyway, two or three days before Friday. So um, I guess the only way really you can send your gear is if say you're you're staying at the Pair Lodge, we could find out from, from the hotel if we'll take delivery and, and have your parcel waiting for you. Yeah, I, we've never had anyone ask us that in the past over mm -hmm. the last 10 years. And I would recommend that people just take their gear they need for the week on board with them. Um, I think that's the simplest way of making sure it arrives with you. Because even if you have it shipped separately, then there's always the danger that that shipment could go astray somewhere as well. So I, if I was in your shoes, I was flying in. If there's anything I wanted to make sure would come with me, I would take it on board. Um, and I would ship non-essential stuff or check in non-essential stuff. So that would be uh, my recommendation on that. I guess, yeah, I guess basically, okay, the most important gear would be your backpack. And say your sleeping bag, your um, light down jacket, and your running shoes. So those things you can wear on you, or just just hand you know hand carry them. Mm -hmm. And things like um, food, um, I guess you could you could check those in. I mean, we have a, there's a, um, there's a store in Canab, there's an outdoor store where you can get um, camping freeze-dried food, but it may not be the food that you've been used to, but I guess. Um, yeah, if it was in an emergency, you could always resupply yeah. there, but if there's anything that's your favorite item, then I'd definitely take it um, on mm -hmm. board with you. Um, Tess, moving on. Next question. Yeah. Um, okay. There's just somebody um, made a comment here um, about the ESTA. So we mentioned the ESTA, which is what you need if you're from Europe to get to the US. Um, be careful with ESTA. If you've been in countries like Iran or Syria, um, you will need to go to the embassy, the US embassy. Is that the case? I didn't know that. Okay, yes, I didn't know that. I've had it, it was it was for me. I've I, I've had a cousin mm -hmm. uh, who had the problem for this summer, and he did the um, ESTA thing on the internet, and I think he didn't even say because it asks if you've been into. There's a list of I think eleven countries since the first Trump administration. Mm -hmm. And those 11 countries, uh, like banned countries, and if you've been there, they have trace of it, and they will just don't give you the ESTA right away. And so it's it doesn't mean you can't come in, but then you have to uh, have make an appointment at the embassy, probably in Paris, and then like explain why you were in Iran or in Syria, and then they will give you the the esta but it can take time and be very stressful so it's mm. good to make sure you get the esta early on and specifically if you've been in those countries even quite a long time ago yeah well i can see elizabeth very kindly said here it says on the esta website which countries you cannot have visited so <clears throat> i would recommend there's nothing normally an esta lasts for two years so if you're coming i'd get i'd be That'd be the first thing I would do is apply for an ESTA now and be truthful about which countries you've been to and they'll they'll spit it. They won't, you know, issue an ESTA to you if you've been to those countries. So then, as Orly said, you would have to then separately apply to the embassy to make sure you get it. So first thing I would say is apply for the ESTA. If there's a problem, you've been to a country which the ESTA doesn't like, 
then you'll have to go to stage two and apply for your visa through an embassy. Okay, next one. Okay, next question. Rory is asking, what are the typical cutoff times? What is a good pace to stay clear of them? Tess, so, do you want to answer that? Or yeah, so this, this is all, um, um, it's outlined in, in our rules and regs, um, but basically... Um, say for stage one, because you start with an ultra, it's a 50K, which is 32, just under 30 miles for day one. Um, that would be 13 hours. But then the rest of the race um, is 12 hours. And then for the long stage, which is day three and day four, uh, cutoff time is 34 hours. And then um, for the final stage, which is um, a short um, seven miles, um, I believe the cutoff time for that is four hours. So it's pretty generous. Um, that uh, translates to about two and a half miles per hour pace, which is quite, I think it's quite generous. So that's, that's um, where... Um, where you should be if you're thinking of pace. Um, okay, another question about food. Um, about food for supported category, minimum is 800 calories per day and 2000 for long stage, according to kilometer per stage and duration, I think it's not enough. I was thinking about 1200, 1500 and 3000 for long stage, what do you think? Um, so what we um, what we ask for in the equipment and mandatory um, page is the minimum that would be acceptable. So obviously most people might want to bring a little bit more. So you will just have to to make sure that if you do take a little bit more, it it still stays within the range of. Um, the maximum weight, which is 12 kilos, including, you know, your food and the rest of your stuff that you're carrying. I hope that answers your question, Dom. Um, it's, just, it's just a maximum 12 kilos. It's, it's, whether yes. it's supported or unsupported, mm -hmm. you can have a maximum 12 kilos that you take. Um, okay. Uh, In okay, here's okay. El Elizabeth one. raised her hand. Do you want to mm -hmm. unmute and speak, Elizabeth? Ah, yeah, thank you. So, uh, it's not a question, but it's just, um, uh, just a comment on the food, which might be helpful. So, um, when you plan your food for the race, I would plan like you have your breakfast and then you have the food that you take in during the stage when you're out. And I think for the supported category, there is a minimum there, right? That you need to actually carry with you. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And then you have your your dinner whatever, when you come back to camp. Like that's the, the sort of the three big categories of food. And so, mm -hmm. so when you plan out how much food to take, it's really good if you can make an estimate of how fast you'll be moving, because then you know because you know the distances, so then you know the approximate amount of hours you will be out. And then you figure out through training or some estimations how much food you might need per hour. And, and I would say typically that ends up being maybe in the 150 to 200 calories per hour range. And so if you do it that way, you will end up with a sensible amount of food that mm -hmm. will sustain you, but not be too much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As an example, I just checked my my own kit and food list that I had still have it since 2016. And so <laughs> backpack weighed um, just under seven and a half kilos. Mm -hmm. And out of that, the food was about four and a half kilos. Mm -hmm. Wow. And six, I think. So just under three kilos of gear mm -hmm. and four and a half kilos of food. Mm -hmm. So just yeah. example. So, so, so for the supported um, categories, Elizabeth, so they'll actually be able to leave 90%, I would think, of their food will be able to stay in camp. Um, you know, 
in it'll the be game. like no more than say what half a kilo that they would take with them on the course for the day so they can take more and they can have have the luxury some more yeah. food maybe if they need yeah um but i think it's you know it's a really port- important point you made earlier about the weight of the backpack um mm-hmm. 12 kilos as you say the maximum it's still a very generous weight mm-hmm. if you are self supported and you do the race with a backpack i really encourage everyone to get the weight down yes you need all the gear mm-hmm. but you can have all the gear and a pack that weighs 8 kilos and you will have everything you need mhm mhm mm-hmm. so, yeah i think opinion. there's this there's this human nature we've found that People, it's a bit like when I remember tell, somebody telling me years ago, when you pack to go on a, a journey somewhere, you know, put, lay out all your stuff on your bed and then have it, you know, cut it in half because you always take too much stuff with you, right? All these people just in case, and you mm-hmm. always take, you know, twice as many t-shirts, twice as much underwear, and you never use it, right? And the same thing applies for our race as well. So people always regret having take so taking so much stuff with them yeah, yeah. need much less than you think and so yeah. also mm-hmm. also um Tess, you were talking about the the cut off times and what what speed you need to move at and your mm-hmm. pack weight will greatly influence how fast you move so that's another yeah. reason to to keep it light and of course it doesn't affect the the supported category but if yeah. you it's really important it's true. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So another question here regarding the supported category. Is there accumulated weight limit for supported bag plus backpack? I.e. 12 kilograms for supported bag, but for the backpack? No, um, the 12 kilos is for everything. So that includes your backpack. Yeah, so I think they're I think they're misunderstanding it here because mm-hmm. there isn't two bags. Mm-hmm. Um, basically, you know, it, it's your total weight is 12 mm-hmm. kilos. Um, and you have to figure out, you know, what you want to carry each day. So the total weight is 12 kilos. Mm-hmm. And obviously you don't need, um, a 20 liter backpack, you know, you'll just need a, whatever you think you'll need on the course for that day. Yeah. Um, but Everything together will be twelve kilos, excluding water. Mm-hmm. Uh, just one thing um, for supported category, um, because we're saying that you just carry what you need um, for the stage. Um, but bear in mind that for the long stage, you will be required, and it's actually in our equipment page. So it's mm-hmm. there's a, a, an additional note to supported. Um, category participants because you will have um, to carry your um, your um, light down jacket because you'll you'll be running through the night mm-hmm. your sleeping bag uh, whether I think whether you intend to to sleep um, in the sleeping checkpoints or not you will be required to take your sleeping um, bag and also um, your dinner um, food. So on the long stage, you will be carrying um, a little bit more than the other stages. So just bear that in mind. I see Davide um, Ugolini, um, our course director, said it's a very safe race because there are many doctors in the staff. Mm-hmm. Runners can run peacefully. I'm not sure what he means by running. I think he means um with peace of mind <laughs> with peace of mind yes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes so that's very true actually we've um we've got a very good medical staff um we have a a medical director who's a an emergency physician in Boston uh Josh Mullerella and he has been um you know experienced in wilderness medicine since 2012 he's been with the race since 2013 he's been our course director he's been our medical director since 2014 so um he comes year after year and uh he brings a team of five doctors with him so you have a doctor at every checkpoint 
and a doctor at camp. And then as the checkpoints close, all the doctors come back to camp. So you have a, a team of six doctors at camp um, by the end of each stage. So you've got a nice big medical tent and uh, lots of support for people uh, to to look after them as they as they come in. So we've got we've got a well stocked medical tent and a lot of experienced doctors uh, on the staff. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. thank you for reminding me, Davide. Um, okay, we have a question. Um, at the moment, how many entrants um, are there? Um, we have um, about, um, for the self-supported, just um, over 55 and about 20 um, supported. That's where we stand right now. But we're hoping to have more because registration closes uh, end of June. So we got a few more months um, Yeah, before we close. Um, okay. Uh, Eddie is saying, I'm excited to ditch my phone for a week. That's great. Uh, digital detox, indeed. Um, since backpack weight is key, what, if any, devices have past participants brought to take pictures, if anything? Um, some have a tiny uh, camera with them, or uh, if they take their phone, they, they use their phone to take photos. But some just don't bother with taking photos because we have... Um, a, a professional uh, race photographer that takes amazing photos of you so you can just not worry about it and uh, just enjoy enjoy the course enjoy the experience yeah well our photographer will take photographs that you know you yourself won't be able to take because you're taking pictures of you out there in remote landscapes so that's one of the great things plus there'll be you know, pictures of the groups and camp life, etc. So that's what we'd always recommend. You you go for that. You don't have to worry about it. But obviously, take um your phone to take photographs if that's what you want, and record your own experience while you're there. Uh, just be aware that we don't provide charging facilities, so you're gonna have to make um mm. good judicious use of your phone for the week, yeah. uh, because you won't be able to recharge it. I mean, some people have taken solar chargers mm -hmm. uh, but you remember you're adding weight then so the more weight you add and it's it's just you know creating more of an issue for you and you know let me tell you a story about um one time we had a chief executive who got in contact with us a few years ago and said look i really want to do your race but i see one of your rules is that you uh don't allow us to use mobile phones and i said yeah that's right but he said, look, I'm a really important guy and people need to be in touch with me all the time. And I said, well, you know, I'm sorry to hear that, but the whole part of the experience here is that you're disconnected from your normal digital world. We don't want you making calls, you know, annoying other people. We don't want you, um, you know, receiving calls. We want you to really switch off. And he said, oh, I'm, I'm, in that case, I'm, I'm just too important. I can't let go of my phone. And then he obviously thought about it because a few days later he he came back and he says, "Okay, I've I've managed to make arrangements where I've delegated things. Other people can can uh, do the thing. So I'm going to join up." I said, "Great." Anyway, I remember at the end of the race he came up to Tess and myself and he said, "You know what? Thank you for being tough with me and not letting me take my phone because this was the the best experience I've ever had." I I never thought I could get away from my phone for a week. And I now realize why you do that. And, um, you know, it's important to us. You know, we're, we don't want to add technology to our race. We like people to kind of get back to nature and have that feeling of being disconnected. I mean, you've got 358 other days of the year to be stuck to your phone and be, you know, just be looking at your phone the whole time. So here's a, here's one week where you really switched off. Um, and probably about 80% of the course, we don't have a, a cell phone signal anyway, so you wouldn't be able to get connected. But um, mm -hmm. we really like people to, to really get away from it all. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question, Tess. I see something about snakes here. Yeah. Um, so I guess Dom was asking about possibility to charge the watch. You've, you've just answered that. 
Um, okay. So what about snakes? Is this something we have to be worried about? Um, and spiders? Well, we are in um, the desert, so they do exist. Sna there's creepy crawlies out there. There's snakes. There's tarantulas. There's Jerusalem spiders. Um, with snakes, it's not always, um, you know, the venomous um, rattlesnakes that you've got the um, king snakes as well that are um, not harmless. But um, people do see them. Um, but I think because, you know, when you're when you're running or walking, um, especially in groups, you create vibration on the ground and ten, you know the tendency for snakes is just to move away from you they're not gonna they don't search you out they don't look for you if anything they move away from you um but if by any chance you you do find some like on the trail um just avoid them just the dr josh always just say she says just leave them alone you know it's when people start like poking at them or I don't know trying to get close to take a photo that's when you then you know you you risk getting bitten so um touch wood we've um yeah we've never had anyone get bitten so just just be aware we always just say you just you know they're there people they come back to camp and get all excited yeah you know we saw some snakes on the way on the trail um, so yeah, they are there. Um, so you just have to to be aware. The one thing that's quite good um, is um, all our tents have a ground sheet, and the ground sheet actually is velcroed to all uh, the sides of your tent. So really, every night, I mean, our our camp crew make sure that they're vel velcroed um, together. So then there's no uh, it's nowhere that you know any creepy crawlies could crawl in but before you go to bed just make sure that that that's done um and like you know they say in the desert like even in mds they always say in the morning before you put your shoes on just check give it a shake and um just check in case some creepy crawly decided to to sleep in your shoes <laughs> overnight. Yeah. As, as tess says you know these <laughs> these um creatures it's their terrain they live in the desert but they're more scared of us yeah. than us of them oh, yeah. so you know they, if they were to see movement they're likely to slither away they don't want to be anywhere near us because they know humans are more dangerous to them than the other way around so um if you if you don't go oh, yeah. looking for them your chances are yeah, you won't be a snake mm -hmm. okay steve's asked a question how difficult is it to follow the course so, um, somebody needs to mute. Thank you. Uh, so how do I would say it's very easy. Um, you'll, you'll see Steve from our rules that we actually have course markers out there between sort of 50 and a hundred meters. Uh, and if the course That's is, uh, you know, great. is more, what I would say, uh, difficult to see, then we'll actually have more mar markers out there mm -hmm. more frequently so that you'll always be able to see the marker from the previous marker. Mm -hmm. um, and at nighttime, we actually have illuminated markers. So we have LED lights and we have reflective markers as well. So you can actually in the nighttime even see them better than you can during the day because they, they really stand out. Your headlamp will pick them up and you've got these LED markers. Yeah. So it does mean you've got to keep your wits about you. Uh, you know, you 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 do have to look for them. But as long as you're you know, you know paying attention, um, you lost. You just you just keep your eye on the markers. I don't um, have more questions. Somebody needs to mute there. In GGG wildlife. Squirrels, antelopes, condors are beautiful. Thank you, Davide. <laughs> Davide sees them all when he's marking the course. <laughs> yeah. We're just make sure it's muted. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'll go. Any okay. more questions? I don't have any. I might even be done soon, actually. 
Yeah. Any more mm -hmm. points you want to raise, Tess? Anything? I I don't have any more. Okay. Let me see. I'm just crawling back up in case I missed somebody. Uh, ta -ta -ta -ta. Mm -mm. No. It's all good. Yeah, I guess it's all good. Great. Well, we'll um, we will be uh putting this um, Zoom meeting. We've recorded it, so we'll be putting it on the website, so people can refer to it later or. For those people who didn't make it tonight or today, um, they can still uh, listen to the recording or watch it uh, when they get the link from our website. Mm -hmm. We'll be doing some more Zoom meetups over the next uh, four or five months, probably one every maybe month or so, three to four weeks. Uh, we'll line up several people to talk about different things. Um, uh, Elizabeth Barnes has very kindly offered to appear as a key presenter in one of our future um, Zoom meetups, and she'll be talking about, I'm not sure, was it training or gear or something? I think uh, we said training. She, yeah. Elizabeth's so good, she could talk about anything. She's an expert on several subjects, so <laughs> we haven't decided which one to make her uh, talk on yet. Um, and, uh, yeah, we'll have some other guest speakers coming in to talk about different things. We might have our race commissioner, Garth Reeder. He might come and talk about the rules on one of them as well. Um, and we'll probably have the medical director talk, you know, probably May, June, closer to the uh, deadline for signing up to talk about um, the medical form and, you know, other do's and don'ts as far as prevention uh, of injuries and, how to care, cater for yourself out there and what he and his team will be doing. So um, there's just uh, one, one last question here from Severin. Mm -hmm. uh, she's asking whether um, can we say everything is okay at um, to our family during the race? Um, okay. <clears throat> there, there's really no way for you to communicate um, with your family, but, um, one thing that we do is uh, we take emails for you. So we have, um, just like MDS, we have um, a link where friends and family can send you emails. And so what we do is we print these emails and deliver to you at, at our camps. So that's usually um, a great source of excitement and inspiration. And what we should say is, Severine, is that to allow people know that you're making progress, mm -hmm. we update our website every day. Mm -hmm. So it talks about it'll update it with people who've DNF'd and people, what times they've made for that stage. Mm -hmm. And then on uh, Facebook and Instagram, we'll have multiple updates during the day, again, on the results, mm -hmm. uh, but also on individuals as well. So we'll actually have We'll post photographs of people, groups of people on the course mm -hmm. and be updating them on how you're doing. So there'll be an opportunity for you to appear uh, your name, hopefully your photograph on Facebook uh, multiple times during the week, which will enable your uh, friends and family to see how you're actually doing during mm -hmm. that week. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, already saying, yeah, that's why you must smile the whole way. <laughs> you never know where the cameraman is, where the photographer is. <laughs> yeah, they usually pop up behind some cactus somewhere. We have somebody who's done um, G2G several times now, and he's learned um, how to uh, spot the photographer. And as soon as he sees the photographer, he starts running. <laughs> so he gets, he looks really good. <laughs> Or he, or he collapses. Some others collapse to get the drama. <laughs> it's a bit like you know, a bit like a professional footballer. You know, they're rolling around on the ground in agony, and then thirty seconds later, they're up running around again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. I think that's good. It. 
Great. Well, that, thank you. That's, thank um, you so much, everyone. Yeah, it's been just an hour and eight minutes. So thank you very much. I hope mm -hmm. you all learned something from that. Um, and please look out in future for the next Zoom meetups. Um, as I said, they'll be on different topics. We'll let you know uh, in advance and we'll have the same format. You'll be getting a link sent to you for the actual Zoom meetup for that night. We'll probably mm -hmm. do it about the same time um and uh hopefully you can join us for that as well so thank you very much yeah stay well everyone and um good luck with your training good luck good night good night thanks bye bye bye, bye. <laughs> see you bye. thank you bye okay